Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. And welcome to our first in a multi part series on port, the fortified wine port. This is port for the WSET level four. We call this mastering port for the WSET level four diploma. Um, this is the first part that will go through the history of port. Uh, and if you have any comments, questions or concerns, please pop them in the comment section below this video on YouTube or get in touch with us with the array of social media at the bottom of each of the slides. I am the far left hand corner there at Wine with Jimmy. The two middle ones are my wine schools and the far right hand side is my wine bar if you are that way inclined with all that social media stuff. So we're going to go through um, Portugal's, uh, well, port's history. So you are aware of the foundations of this very unique and special fortified wine, because uh, of course it can be tested uh, in the diploma certificate. So let's set the scene. You've got a picture there of, um, nice black and white picture of a harvest occurring in the Douro Valley, and that is from Taylor's. Uh, and we're gonna go through a lot of history dating back really to sort of uh, the 14th century is our key sort of stating point. But um, it is worth noting that wine has been produced here for an extensively long period of time. There's an, uh, a really great geographer uh, and writer of ancient Greece, so of the Greek cities called Strabo. And Strabo indicated that the inhabitants here of the northwest of the peninsula of Iberia were drinking around 2000 years ago. And of course, this includes a lot of the wines, uh, specifically the northwest. We know that from Galicia, for instance, but also the Douro Valley. The Romans that came here arrived in Portugal in the second century BC and remained, of course, here for around 500 years and they grew vines on the banks of the Douro Valley, of course, uh, instigating some of those early, um, quite uh, wonderfully formed terraces that we know of. Um, and of course, that has been um, expanded upon today as it is the principal area for port production in the Douro Valley. OK, so just to get um, our whereabouts, so you are very clear on what we are talking about in terms of the geography. Um, we are looking, of course, here um, and I've identified a couple of places here. So this is the in Portugal, the nation of Portugal. We are looking at the Douro River, which is the river that runs in. Uh, and let me do some freehand drawing on this. Uh, it's probably the best idea, but runs in just here, of course, comes from the Douro Valley and then empties into the Atlantic. The, uh, the Douro River starts its life off in the Sistema Ibérica in uh, sort of central north Spain as it winds its way down through Castilla y Lyon, uh, famous places, of course, that it goes past, like Valladolid, uh, and um, uh, uh, many of the key wine regions like Ribera de, de Duero, Toro, Rueda, and all those places. But then it enters, of course, into Portugal as it then meanders through the Trazos Montes area uh, and then heads towards, of course, the Atlantic uh, and on the estuary of the river where it hits the Atlantic. You have the city of Oporto. And then opposite that city, you have the smaller town of Villa Nova de Gaia. Uh, and they're important because this is where many of the port houses or lodges or shippers are located in Villa Nova de Gaia and to a smaller extent, Oporto. Uh, so that is ideal because that area is cooler due to the Atlantic and has a more moderated climatic condition for aging and storing the wines. But we are focusing on that red area, which is in the upper part of the, um, the, the, the Portuguese area of the Douro River. And this is the Douro Valley. Uh, and uh, we'll go into much greater detail about the Douro Valley and its locations, its cities, um, the sub regions, uh, rainfall numbers on future 
uh, sessions in this uh, multi-part series on port. But so you're well aware, that's what we're looking at. Uh, of course, Portugal is a part of the Iberian Peninsula. It forms uh, the majority of the westerly side of it. It is only Galicia in the north. Um, so that is off to the north of this map in Spain, which is a, a part, form, forms part of the Iberian western side. Um, so it's a very thin stretched country that goes pretty much all the way down that western side of Iberia, down towards the Al Algarve in the bottom. Okay, so the first thing we should really note in terms of history is that we're going to go back to something which is called the Treaty of Windsor. And really to get a good idea about port, you need to understand really um, the emerging friendship and alliance between the nations of Portugal and England. That is really the almighty significance of why this style of wine, port, became so important as it was, uh, it found an easy market into the English empire um, and the ex ever expanding English empire. Um, so how do we form this alliance and friendship to begin with? So as you have at the top of your slide, at the end of the 14th century in 1386, you have the Treaty of Windsor. And this was established uh, and this gave quite a close political, military and commercial alliance between the nations of England and Portugal. And in fact, this has been built upon years and years and centuries and centuries down the line. We'll go through that very shortly. But really, this friendship of alliance politically through military and also therefore trade has really been significantly um, um, kept for the last, well, for, for all this time. Um, so there's a very good, you know, good links between the two nations. Um, so under the terms of the Treaty of Windsor, each country gave the merchants of the other country the rights to reside in its territory and also to trade on equal terms. And this is important because this is something which was not very widely done across Europe at that time. Um, very strong and active trading links, of course, were established uh, and developed. Um, and you find many English and other associated ones like Scots as well, um, would start to settle in the landscape in Portugal. I, I would guess there's much more um, migration from England to Portugal than vice versa, uh, pretty much due to the fact that, of course, Portugal seems like a bit more of an exotic place than England. But, of course, England held very high esteem, certainly in its wealth at that time. By the second half of the 15th century, a significant amount of Portuguese wine was being exported to England. Uh, and often that was exchanged for products like salt cod, which uh, England had in abundance. So food was coming into Portugal and then wine was going in towards uh, England. A lot of the original wines were not from the Douro Valley. They're actually green wines that were from the Minho area, which is the area between the Douro Valley and the Atlantic coast. Uh, and these were seen as quite acidic, pale and thin wines. Today we call them Vino Verts and they, are, they can be wonderful, but they were not widely accepted in England due to the fact that they were very pale, light and acidic. Um, the English always desiring something a bit more robust, intensive, alcoholic and sweet. And of course, port was the great, uh, the great example for that. So then after that, we have um, a series of trade wars, not between the Portuguese and the English, but of course, between England and France. If you know anything about the English history and French history, they are intrinsically linked uh, and often there is a lot of love lost between the two nations. So this was the 17th century. Um, these trade wars between England and France um, really stifled England's possibility of uh, obtaining good trade from its closest nation and then surrounding nations. So they increased trade with their amicable friends that have been friends with the Portuguese for quite a few centuries now. Um, the powerful red wines became very popular, as I mentioned, 
And in order to stabilize these red wines, so they would be able to be shipped safely back to England, they were fortified with some brandy. Um, so they, it meant that these wines got back to England in good condition. Uh, and this process actually originally started when two British merchants visited the Abbot of Lamego. And let's just scribble that down so you understand that, because it's actually not on this slide. Uh, so the Abbot of Lamego. There you go. And these two merchants visited this bishop uh, and found that the sweet wines which um, this abbot was producing um, with this fortification was of much higher quality than the drier wines that they had started to uh, um, um, uh, look at and eventually import. So they shipped the entire stocks of this fortified wine back to England. And hence we have the, the, the beginnings of this um, fascination with port into the English Empire. Now, it wasn't the first fortified wine style. We have a lot of the Dutch to thank for that, that uh, predate this. But we also have um, evidence down in the Abbey of, uh, sorry, in the University of Montpellier in the south of France, of fortification occurring um, as early as the 13th century. So the French have quite a significant claim to actually being the first to start fortifying wine. The Dutch also. Uh, and this is a little bit after that, but nonetheless, still a very important product, of course. Um, and then around that same time, and this is the picture you have here, you have Kopk, and established in 1638, these guys. So around the same time in that 17th century, a number of these quite famous port shippers were established. So you have Kopk there, you have Wars, Croft, uh, Kyles Harris, Taylors. Um, and traditionally, these were uh, shippers, um, and they were more like agents that took a commission for shipping port uh, back uh, home or abroad, uh, maybe into to Holland or, or wherever it may be. Um, and they actually acquired their ports through brokers in, in, in the Douro, and they stored them in lodges, of course, uh, in Oporto or Villanova de Gaia, mainly Villanova de Gaia, where it was, uh, of course, much more accessible for ships uh, and trade, but also much more suited to long-term storage because of the climatic conditions, the moderated climatic conditions of that area. Um, so yes, uh, these are called lodges here in Villanova de Gaia. So they're kind of like warehouses or wine cellars. Um, and uh, yes, Eventually, these agents became shippers in their own right, of course, uh, because they became quite powerful with their own vineyards, eventually wineries, and then bottling facilities. Um, so it was the starting blocks being more agents, but then, of course, becoming uh, producers and shippers in their own right eventually. Um, then we have uh, the early 18th century, and this is uh, Lord Methuen in this picture, we have the Methuen Treaty. So this is 1703, ensuring that Portuguese wines would receive lower rates of tax in England than those of any other country. Of course, this meant that this was mightily, significantly important for producers and, of course, to make more money. Uh, this meant there was a bit of an exodus out to the Douro Valley and to Oporto. And of course, the production boomed at that time. This popularity led to the production of very, very huge amounts of quite poor quality port style wines using poor quality spirit or low quality wines from the vineyards. Uh, and um, they often, in fact, bolstered colour with elderberry juice, just to sort of balance the fact that the wine was poor quality. It's almost sort of applying makeup or, or really sort of covering over the, the cracks of, uh, of this wine. So the bit of a boom during that time, unfortunately, um, and, it, and it really sort of continued for that first half of the 18th century. And that leads us to um, the middle of the 18th century. And we have the Marques de Pombal, now, the Marcus de Pombal um, was uh, a very important figure because he was very much um, uh, disappointed by the poor quality that was being uh, 
produced in the region and in action against this massive volume being produced in 1756 um, the port vineyards were officially demarcated so there was uh, an outline um, and a boundary which was uh, uh, structured in in 1756 um, there were production regulations as well uh, and this Marcus de Pombal was at the head of this he was the prime minister of that time so this meant really that this is possibly the first in the world of really a demarcated area um, you're talking about uh, a quality control here which predates uh, you know like the 1855 classification for example in uh, in Bordeaux of course Tokai will have quite a uh, big claim in Hungary to being quite old as well also this prime minister created the Campagna Geral de Agricultura das Vinas de Alto Duro uh, which is sometimes just called the Campagna or the Real Campagna Vela uh, and this uh, was basically where all the ports for export, export had to be bought. Um, there were um, fixing of prices here and also exclusive right to supply the spirit used in fortification within this Campania. Um, so these decrees were issued. Uh, a lot of them were not that popular, uh, but due to these um, demarcation of the vineyard land and this more governance of the production here, sales volumes and prices of port began to rise again because um, really at the start of the century due to the mass overproduction um, due to the Methuen Treaty um, really the, 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 the value of the grape in the Douro Valley and the wine produced in the Villanova de Gaia completely plummeted. Uh, so this meant uh, these um, enactments, these edicts had to really sort of counter that and that's exactly what this did the 1756 demarcation of the Douro Valley. Um, so next up then we are looking at um, some of the early 19th century wars. Uh, so this was quite challenging in this area and this is including things like the Peninsula War uh, and also then the Portuguese Civil War. The Peninsula War which was 1807 to 1809 and the Portuguese, the first Portuguese Civil War in 1828 to 34. Um, Portugal suffered of course throughout all of this uh, and the Douro was no exception. Um, so that of course meant that there's a bit of a hindrance in, in the production here um, due to the military action. Uh, vineyards were later in that century, uh, so this is sort of 1870s, were hit by mildew and then of course phylloxera uh, and um, in order to survive many small farmers and producers needed to sell their land and properties. The shippers who were, remember they're quite powerful agents originally but then became owners of land of their own right, took this as an opportunity and started to buy up a lot of the landscape from these farmers, of course, amalgamating uh, into a bigger entity and a more powerful entity. Uh, and this is where um, these own vineyards and of course, Kinter's wineries were established at that time. Okay, um, then we have the, um, the 20th century. So in the 1900s, uh, this first half of it, we have some um, new institutions being created. Here is the Instituto de Vigna de Porto, uh, and that was created in 1933. Uh, and that pretty much was around the same time as most of Europeans' um, commissions and regulations for wine, you know, the 30s in France, of course, um, uh, sort of 50s in, in Spain and so on. So similar sort of time um, for the regulation of this alcoholic drink um, and responsible for the administration and supervision of the port industry. And then secondly, uh, um, uh, around that time as well, the Casa de Doro was uh, uh, created. And this is really a, um, a kind of an assisting authority to supervise the growers within the port landscape, the demarcated port area, so the Douro Valley, for example. Um, around this time, uh, this is when we have the creation of a hierarchy of vineyard land rated A to I based on their suitability for producing port. This is the Beneficio, 
which we'll actually look at in next session in the wine law and wine business section. Um, and that would, of course, guarantee um, higher quality production um, when you're looking at an A-class vineyard, B-class vineyard, for instance. OK, um, both of these institutions as well, the Casa de Duro and the IVP, as it's known, the Instituto de Vino de, Por um, uh, de Porto, also controlled the purchase of the spirit. So this is the Arguedente, which we'll talk a lot more about in the production of port, um, which is the fortification spirit. OK. Um, then we have the World Bank scheme after that. Um, so this is in the 1980s uh, and we're going to go into also into the sort of uh, the start of the 21st century. Um, the World Bank scheme uh, offered very low interest loans to the Douro growers who could plant or replant up to around 10 hectares of vineyards provided as the land was classed as A or B class, and that's in the beneficiaries, so that's highest quality land. Um, so this meant that, of course, they were aiming to improve quality of this area, uh, and only by using five prescribed varieties as well, the classic five we'll talk about later in these sessions as well. Um, great major shippers like Coburn's, Ferrara, Ramos Pinto, um, they joined with the local university to fund vineyard research programs uh, and then planting was increased as well and around two and a half thousand hectares of vineyards were planted on these wider um, terraces which are called patamares and they follow the contours of the land uh, and uh, that is what you see in that picture there so that's the creation of the patamares. 1986 sent, uh, seen Portugal's entry into the European Union uh, and this meant that uh, you would uh, have a few changes of course uh, falling in line with the EU membership. Um, by 1991 producers were permitted, this is producers of port, to source and buy their own Arguadente on the open market so not fixed leading to a rise in quality and spirit and therefore port overall. So this was a real sort of golden age in the quality of port. Um, yeah, so that is your EU membership. Uh, 2003, after that, we have the creation of the Vinos de Porto y de Duro, the IVDP. Uh, and this um, is basically the new interprofessional body, uh, basically there to supervise both Porto and Duro and reflecting the growing importance of the drier wines of the Douro Valley. Uh, so that includes the whites and the reds and even sparkling in that area. Um, and further developments have continued to be made in the last 20 years up to today. Um, newer, improved patamares have been uh, developed. Uh, and we are finding that those five original core classic grape varieties, there's more being added to the blends. Uh, and in, in the winery specifically, there's lots more um, uh, alternative methods being used. We'll talk through on later sessions to uh, increase the quality within port itself. OK, so um, that is the section on um, port history. That brings us up towards today. Uh, I do hope you've enjoyed it. The next session will be on the wine laws and business. So we'll look at sales, uh, volume. Um, and we'll talk about things like the beneficio, the wine laws and labelling and things like that. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any comments, uh, questions or concerns, please pop them in the comment section below this video or get in touch via social media. Um, all of those are on the bottom. Uh, the bottom left is me. The bottom, mi the middle two are my wine schools and the far right hand side is my wine bar, all in London, United Kingdom. If you are ever visiting London, please come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle or a magnum. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your study. Cheers.